Thank you. Oh, so I've, I've got three for Mel and Andrew straight away. Okay, so have secondary schools mentioned any noticeable positive differences in pupils from your school? Oh, oh. <laughs> do, you need, do you need a mobile one? <laughs> I can be mobile. Oh, yeah, that'd be fab. Thanks. That's okay. Uh, sorry, was, was that secondary school? Sorry. Um, so, I don't know who's on one, so I have secondary schools. Um, where our school is, um, our, our local secondary school is literally kind of next door. So, majority of our children, 90% of them go kind of next door. So, we, we've got good links with them anyway. Um, and yet, yes, they have. Um, we, we tend to focus a lot on anyone on kind of growth mindset and resilience as, as part of our curriculum anyway, uh, as, as well as all the workshops we've done. Um, but we have had kind of a few comments back. Some of our year, some of the year sevens do come back, and it's just some great stories. Like they come out and say, "You were right. You know what, what, what you are doing is, is helping us. You know, they didn't value it at the time, <laughs> but it's, it's to get them to come back and, and say that um, we, we do a lot of transition work with them anyway. So we've got good links with the, with the year seven tutor. So she, she's often in and, and explaining stories, but just to get the children to come back and say, even and we get them to talk to the, the year sixes as well about what's going on. So yeah, they certainly notice a difference in kind of the, the growth mindset and the resilience. There's a lot more bounce back ability uh, to kind of word I used to have. Uh, yeah, that's what I see us. Okay, there's actually another couple of questions for you guys. <laughs> um, I'm not sure if, the, I think it was a gentleman who had this question. Um, it says, where do you go from here? You cannot keep it quiet. My son needed you. Um, yeah, that's, that was miss myself. Um, I feel my, my, my son was seriously let down by his uh, junior school. And now um, he's moved on and there's a few other things happened. But if this was where, you know, around when, when he needed it, you know, so everything starts somewhere. So you're, you know, I, you're the first one I've heard of doing this and it's, it's absolutely amazing. And now where do you go? You can't keep it a secret. You know, do you go to the education authority? Do you go further afield? Where, you know, because for, for, you know, I feel my son would really have benefited. Uh, so now we're here trying to fix what we could have fixed over the last six years. So where, where do you go? You know, you've got professional people in lots of different areas. What's next? <laughs> so, I mean, to, just to kind of, it is very much a frustration for us anyway. Uh, I know you'll pick up on it in a minute. Um, you know, we're doing this because we want to, and um, it's, it's having that conversation with different schools. You know, we, we, our, our doors are open. We, we've already had kind of half a dozen schools to come visit us and say, you know, "What are you doing?" Um, you know, we, we, we're not trying to keep a secret. You know, we, we are kind of Twitter. We, we're banging on the door. Yeah, you know, we need this. We work with kind of our local teaching schools. I don't know if you're familiar with Lincoln Kyra. Um, they're based kind of Lincoln Way, so uh, you know, we do work with them and we, and we offer services. You know, we don't, we don't have all the answers, but we are willing to work with people. Um, and the, the message I kind of say is, it's what works in my school probably wouldn't work in another school. It's, but it's knowing your children in your school. So, I, I feel that my school hid behind a policy. That policy was yeah. written following guidance from the Educational Council or whatever, whatever it may, Ofsted. Yeah. And, and Ofsted need to understand if we hit the uh, the behaviours earlier, then we can fix lots of things later in life. Yeah, it, it, the way I have kind of pinched the microphone, it's not all about kind of Ofsted and kind of the driving force kind of from the Ofsted or Department for Education. It's interesting that we got two curriculum kind of throwbacks when we actually did the talk, because it's how schools read the curriculum, because we're, we're all kind of doing different curriculum programmes. Our curriculum really lends itself to the, the motions that we've kind of put in place, which has been brilliant. It's broad and balanced. We can get art, we can get music, we can get English, we can get all sorts of different subjects in. Um, what we would like to say is we would love to see what we do at Spilsby in every single primary school. Of course we would. It is, it is about those kind of benefits for children. Um, it's about every single child in Lincolnshire having what we offer at our school. Um, um, but uh, different head teachers, different chair of governors, different focuses, different cohorts, um, different schools all the way around Lincolnshire. So you're always going to be up against those kind of barriers. 
we will stand up and we will say and shout louder, that actually, we're not really concerned about the data, because actually, you are a little bit, um, <laughs> but we want healthy and happy children. We want those children that can normalise that language. We want those children that have had that music, that art, that creative kind of part of those curriculums and actually can do the maths and English alongside it. We have an open door policy. You know, like I said on the stage, people can visit us. Somebody's already said, can we visit? Absolutely. Come and talk to our children. Come and talk to us. We will even come out and speak to governors. We'll talk to schools um, and try and kind of pick up on that. Because what we do have, we do know it's unique. Um, but what we will say is kind of, I, I did kind of miss it out earlier, but it, isn't, it doesn't actually take a lot of time in our day. It's it really is about the quality of time that is spent. We fit all this in in 30 seconds, quick peg on a quick peg on an emotion circle. I, I, so I understand and I understand the curriculum side of it, you know, and great, my son's learning maths, English and everything else. But if it's not in there about emotional understanding, in six months to me, that might not mean anything because my son will be down a path where it doesn't matter what he can do curriculum-wise because he's now on a path where the, the journey is going to be just keeping him here. The, the thing that I'm, I'm clinging to at the minute, the, the, the hope that I've got, is uh, Ofsted are doing their new um, curriculum consultation at the minute, starting for September 19, and one of the massive focuses is wellbeing. So if that comes in September, every school will be doing it. Yeah. So that, that is the, the one kind of glimmer of hope. So to... have you been in touch and said, right, guess what we've got? Oh, yeah, I, I've... Oh, Fantastic. I'm a bit of a geek, I'll throw you on. Do you know what I, I mean, I have... no, but that's, that's, that, that was my question. Yeah, I, I have replied to the consultation, saying that this is a great idea, that, you, that well-being is going to be a focus. And you'll go into schools, and you won't only look at the, 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 the data at the end. You know, we're not at the results factory. It is, so, so are, are your kids happy? And, and for me, that is, yeah, and, and that's how it should okay. be. So Thank you. we'll probably explain the long way around it, but, but yeah. Great, thanks. We lived in Wales for a couple of years, and um, uh, they, the education authority there, equivalent to Ofsted, um, went through that process, um, looking at wellbeing, and rolled out across the whole of Wales, um, sort of implementing wellbeing in school, very similar to what you're doing, um, and it worked really, really well. They found that actually education was like 20 years behind England, and it actually bumped it up to a little bit closer. It's still not there. So that was Wales, sorry. Uh, sorry? Where did you say that was, sorry, in? Wales. Wales. Yeah. Um, so they're 20 years yeah, behind England. Where, might be where, where England are now in terms of well being is where Wales were, say, what, nearly five years ago. And it's really, yeah, they're, they're still behind on, on the education front, but on the well being front, they're, they're there. So it is positive to hear that that's coming through in, in England. Just picking up on both of those, the RSE curriculum, we've actually, we've got everything in place already to cover the RSE curriculum that is being kind of delivered out from the DfE and also Ofsted. So, and we've kind of applied for the early adopters. So alongside that, what we have said is we will go out and speak to schools as part of the early adopters because we haven't got any but loads more work to kind of put that in place. So what we have, what we have basically said is we will come out and help schools to do that as well. Um, can I just ask a question? So what would this man here do if his son is saying this kind of stuff? He's saying that he's suicidal and he's self-harming and he's in a state where he doesn't know what to do. The school isn't helping. What, where does he go? Like, can anyone give any pointers? Um, I think that schools have got quite a tough job. We work in 40, over 40 schools. Can you hear me or is it echoey? Uh, over 40 schools and I think schools have got a tough job sometimes because we're expecting them to teach everybody and also to be able to manage their mental health and emotional well-being and I think the things that you're doing in your school are, are fantastic and a lot of schools are getting more on board with that kind of way of thinking about things and I think it's really difficult when you've got then a, a child who's going down a path where as a parent you become very worried about where that might lead him to so I totally kind of get that and empathize with that um, I think it's about there's, there's obviously statutory services that you can refer into. Um, the statutory services that you can refer into. You know, if you're really worried about anybody, whatever age they are, um, then there's always options which are extreme in, in, in relation to using A&E as a way of getting assessed. Um, there's obviously CAMS and those kinds of support networks as well. But I also appreciate having worked in CAMS, and now I'm no longer working in CAMS, um, that she says... Probably, you know, 
try not to say too much, but um, th there can be lots of barriers to accessing support. And I suppose that's where, you know, organisations like mine and, and yours and, you know, and supporting minds come into play because you can access something that you don't have to go through those um, different barriers to get to that support. Um, but it's also not just about working and supporting with a young person. It's about supporting the family and hearing what they've got to say as well, whilst creating a safe space for the young person to work through, but also recognising that actually the dynamics in the family and people are very worried um, also has an impact too. So I think it's more of a holistic approach and systemic approach to helping and supporting someone to be able to move through that. And I think we work with a lot of people who are who do struggle with suicidal ideation and it is a it's massively difficult because want you know there's these these intrusive thoughts that that you know that are very difficult to control but they can be controlled and things can be put in place and and different therapeutic interventions can help with that and i think it's not losing hope that there are things out there that you can access Um, okay, there's a question for Maria. Um, is the motor behaviour checklist available for the public and does it have a name? Okay. All right. I, I hope you're going to do this question because I check my files and I haven't said anything about that. Well, uh, motor behaviour checklist is uh, uh, available but you have to contact with me first because we have as university and as research team the, um, the right reserve for using that. At the moment, uh, we have translated into six different languages, including in, uh, Greek, uh, Polish, uh, Czech, uh, German. Uh, we have the Flemish version and we have the Arabic version, we have uh, the version, the Portuguese, and we have some good publication uh, in cooperation with the University of Sao Paulo from Brazil, the Department of Psychiatrists. And we have also, since this uh, summer, the Chinese version, because I was invited at the University of uh, Beijing, and we have also the Chinese in case that you want to use the Chinese version. But uh, if you want to use the English version, uh, we are trying to take a big sample. That's why I want to have some good contacts with schools uh, and teachers and somebody who is from organization working with children. So we are asking from teachers and professionals to rate their children, take only a few minutes, three to four minutes, to rate uh, a child and it's really valuable because we are producing now, we are developing the norms and the cutoff scores for the British uh, population. Uh, it, uh, it is about, uh, it is designed for teachers, professionals, special educators, uh, speech therapists, anyone who knows the child very well, the behavior of the child, is working with the child more than four or five months, okay, not to see the child once and say, okay, I will rate the behavior of the child. It's not for diagnostic purposes, it's just to assess intervention, so you can use it before and after a, an education approach and to see if it is working in terms of aggression, uh, anxiety, um, social interaction or self-regulation, you can use all clusters, but you can use also separate clusters. And what else? Uh, uh, yes, uh, it is designed for children in primary school, so 6 to 11, 12. We are working on the parents' version and we are working for the, uh, to provide the version for young children. Okay. Keep the microphone. Have another question. Oh, oh. <laughs> you, <laughs> you mentioned the importance of early diagnosis. Yes. What are your thoughts about how this happens in practice in reality? There seems to be resistance to diagnosis amongst professionals. All right. Okay. It's not my fault you asked. Okay. <laughs> so, <laughs> what to say? I'm currently supervising a PhD doctoral student and our, the title and the theme of the research is diagnosis or not. And it has to do with the diagnosis of autism, uh, could be also for attention deficit or depression or uh, personality disorder or whatever. So the idea behind that is how a diagnosis can be helpful or not helpful or could be an obstacle, a barrier 
through the life of the child who is not going to be child forever. I don't know if you know that. It's going to be an adult. And then it's going to ask for a job. And then he's going or she is going to be for an interview. And although it is not legal to say that, okay, I'm not going to hire you because you have a personality disorder or you, because you have, uh, you're an autistic, this is not legal, and they are not saying that, it's some of, in most of the cases, it is uh, the reason of finding a good excuse and taking somebody else. So, there are some very good, and I'm really keen to go for a diagnosis at the early stage because the child will be helped with uh, funding, will be helped with therapies, will be have some financial support, the family, uh, but I don't think that this is always the case. It's not going to be forever very beneficial for the child. Um, we are interview families uh, who has diagnosis, for their children, and we are interview families who their children are not children anymore, and they decided not to have a diagnosis, and there are no uh, agreement between them. Some of them say, I wish to have a diagnosis very early. Some of them say, I wish I would never have a diagnosis for my son because this is a disaster for the rest of his life. So I don't know what to propose. It's good to have a diagnosis in order to understand the needs, in order to support the child. But sometimes let's think that this child is not going to be a child for long. And especially in cases that there is a very high function autis, autistic person or an ADHD or uh, something that it's not so obvious. Uh, or it's not a severe case with very severe symptoms. Probably, I don't know. Yeah. Uh, in my experience, uh, psychologists are, for children are moving away from diagnosis because of the long-term effects of putting a person in a box and labelling them and how difficult it is to get those labels removed. Assessing a child and seeing as a child at need with various problems, you, you can identify those needs and work with those needs rather than put a label on them that will remain with them for the rest of their lives. Thank you. OK, I've got a question. <laughs> Main Andy again. Yes, I've actually got a couple of questions. Maybe. So it might be going off on a tangent a little bit, but I just wanted to say it's really comforting to know that obviously um, some schools in Lincolnshire are delivering with the approach that you are. Um, just a personal question, really, because when I go into schools and deliver the domestic abuse workshops, I feel like I'm opening a can of worms a lot of the times. And sometimes, um, you know, schools, I'm, I don't want to just leave them then, obviously, with, with this to pick up, which we don't because we offer the one-to-ones. Um, but do you find, because... When we get disclosures of children that have been abused, which can obviously lead on to affecting their mental well-being, um, we find that a lot of schools will say, oh, we never had any idea that that was going on at home. So the approach that you're having in schools, do you find that disclosures of things at home are being made quicker before that crisis point? Um, yeah, as with your ethos as school? Yeah, so we um, we actually got this question a little while ago. Some somebody said about a month ago. Somebody said to us, "What? Well, the children aren't going to refer themselves in. So actually, isn't that isn't that a a waste of job title? Which was, I think was the tagline." And we said, absolutely no way. Um, in actual fact, bless her, she isn't here. But but our safeguarding officer, her workload has probably quadrupled I would suggest um, because actually because of the knowledge of it because of the resilience because of the normalizing the language that we really really have kind of pushed the children and parents now refer themselves to our safeguarding officer so actually her workload is far more than it ever was when we when we initially kind of posted her into position um, so we do pick up earlier um, and actually we we will have people, and we spoke about social media earlier, but we will have parents contact us on social media and say, oh, you know that leaflet that you sent home, or you know that workshop, actually that's it. 
oh, I identify with that. Actually, I do think they have problems to do with grief and loss or a separation, you know, that has kind of fallen into those grief and loss stuff that they've worked in the workshop. So um, what we would say is, yeah, referrals have gone up, um, but actually not just from kind of GPs or specialists. It has been from the parents and the pupils themselves. So... Can I just kind of just so it, sorry? It's just kind of flipped on its head. So because um, about four or five years ago, we must have had about seventeen children in TAC, three or four child in needs. Whereas now it, it's kind of it's flipped on its head. We've got three in TAC, but kind of the referrals have gone up. So we're kind of hitting it earlier. So, so yes, but like um, it's very much kind of we work with parents, children do it themselves. It, um, I've got. It's, it's, she's a, a title. She was a learning mentor years and years ago, and her role's kind of developed and evolved since. She's now a family welfare officer. We thought it was quite important to get the word family in because she works with families. Simple as that. Not, quarter to nine Monday morning, she'll have four or five parents waiting to see her. And it, it's that, obviously, working with parents as well, so we can get them first before uh, it can manifest to the children. Thank you. So I, these are all the questions I have, but I was aware of one around food and diet. Do we have, have you got it? Thank you. Um, so this morning, um, just towards the end of our talk, there was some question around sugar. Um, and to be honest, we were talking about it on the way here and it was something that we thought might come up. Um, and so I just thought it'd be helpful just to clarify exactly the message that we're trying to give. Um, and that is that we're dietitians, um, and our role is to tailor public health advice to the child or the person that we are working with. And the people that we're talking about today are children and young people that are very vulnerable. And sometimes just getting out of bed in the morning is a challenge for them. Um, and that's why some of the foods that we were suggesting are maybe not 100% in line with public health messages. But what we're saying is that these individuals are people that are really vulnerable and that everything can be a challenge for them. So what we don't want to do is put more barriers in the way between them and food. What we want to do is just encourage them to eat something regularly that is going to allow their brain to function as well as it possibly can. And as time goes on and they're in a better place in terms of being able to engage with education around sort of healthy eating, then our messages might change a little bit. Um, so I hope that sort of clarifies the point we were trying to make around food. Um, if anyone's got any other questions on that, I'll take them now. <laughs> I actually see it's a no-win situation because we've got the government putting every bit of chemical they can into food mm. that we're being lied to. Mm. The ingredients say and make it look like they're brilliant, but in actual fact, they're not. Mm. So I think it goes a lot deeper. It really does in what the government are poisoning us with. It's not just our food, it's our water so much and it is a different subject and you could go on all day I did agree with the comment that was given this morning mm. but your answer was perfect so thank you um, just kind of echoing that actually I'm a nanny I have been for many years um, so I've worked with all different kind of children, all different kind of backgrounds, different ages. And I think we need to be realistic. Some children just won't eat or they are, they are you know, they, they have, we were talking about sensory processing disorder. Some children, it's an issue. They cannot physically do it or they get beyond them. And I think sometimes it's very easy, isn't it, to say we shouldn't fill them with sugar or we shouldn't do this. But we have to look at, in the end, children being fed is more important than anything because like you say the start in the day and throughout the day and dinner time and what have you is is better than than children than, than, than the more and i've found over the years the more you battle and the more you push actually the more of an issue it becomes with the children and i don't know whether anyone else finds the same thing 
we, we see a lot of teenagers with anxiety around food and a lot of it comes from public health messages, from newspaper articles, from magazines saying that you have to eat this or you have to eat that or this diet's the best or this superstar's on this diet. And, and so a lot of the teenagers that we are seeing with, with mental health problems, it, it stems from... Some of it stems from um, these, uh, I'm trying to find the words, it stems from the newspapers selling stories about certain types of diet. And, and if we're not careful, we create more of a problem by forcing a child to eat something. You know, we create that resistance around food um, and that's not helpful. Um, so what we're trying to do is, is work with what's important at this moment in time and then in the future when hopefully they're in a better place place with the mental health then that's when we would talk around healthy eating and a long-term health thank you so does anybody else have any questions they want to ask do you raise your hand up oh, penny there's somebody oh, sorry. over oh. there Hello, so thank you everyone for, for speaking, it's been really good. Um, we've spent the day sort of like talking about problems and problematizing a lot of things and I just wondered if any of you sort of um, worked on strength-based kind of therapies and that sort of thing, identifying positive things and emphasizing those. Um, yeah, I think a lot of approaches that, that we use are around building on strengths, you know, we, we you're right, there's been a lot of discussion about what goes wrong. Um, and there's lots of really good stuff that goes right as well. Um, and I think therapeutically, a lot of what we're trying to do is build self-esteem and self-confidence. So um, if you've got a child who's really good at something or can actually manage something themselves or a young person or even, you know, um, an adult member of staff, whatever, it's really important to build on those strengths and on that using positive psychology, really, you know, and actually being able to build somebody up rather than, you know, putting them down. And sometimes I think, though, people struggle to find out, know what they're good at or know what their strengths are, don't feel very strong at all. So it's having to find that. Um, a lot of work we do in organisations is uh, we base it around appreciative inquiry. Uh, and that's about, you know, um, we were talking to an organisation organisa yesterday, and instead of going at it with a SWOT analysis, you know, uh, strengths, weaknesses, opportunities and threats, we went in with a SOAR uh, strengths, opportunities, aspirations and results and, and, and approaching things in that different language can be really useful and I think it also means that people are less defensive about what you're about to say um, but definitely therapeutically it's really important to build on strengths because otherwise everything becomes very problem saturated and what we're trying to do is build people up and help them to be able to cope with life and not even cope but to thrive really. <coughs> Hiya. Um, so I appreciate, obviously, today is about that one-to-one, -one, that finding a problem, trying to solve the problem that we've actually got. What, what we did in Spilsbury, because we said, obviously, Andy picked up earlier, that we have 40, our percentage was 40% of kind of that pupil premium children, those vulnerable, those disadvantaged children. And that's why we kind of went for the whole school ethos, the whole school workshop, because actually what we didn't want to do is kind of isolate that child and say, do you know what, you've got anxiety, so we're going to fix that. What we actually said is actually we're going to fix all 30 of you or give you the tools to help you not become unfixed, if you like, because that, to use the children's terms. Um, so that's kind of what we did. We do, there is a massive kind of push for random acts of kindness, which I know there's loads of primary schools doing, um, but it really is embedded, that growth mindset. It's all that strength building. We do kindness tea parties. Um, myself and Andrew wrote a digital resilience program a little while ago. Um, it speaks about that Insta, that magazine culture, and actually we deliver it to our years five and six. That program is now on the mini police program that is delivered across the whole of Lincolnshire in 122 primary schools um, because I was involved in writing that program. So we actually put our learning and our lesson within that program. So it is out there and, and it, we, we didn't really want that child to say, do you know what, everyone's saying that I've got a problem. We didn't want to do that. And actually, we still don't do that, do we? You know, those children don't walk around saying, oh, do you know what, actually, the school are saying this. 
Um, they are just involved with everything. It is to brand that kind of inclusive word, which really does bugbear me sometimes because actually, is it really inclusive? But it is inclusive. It's given to everybody. So no one actually is, is kind of isolated in their feelings. So it's kind of helping all. Yeah, I, th I think you're spot on. It, it, it's, I think, picking up what you said, it, it's quite easy to forget the positives. And like, there's, there's times I've spent in the office, oh, God, we've got kids with anxiety, we, 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 kids need help with this, 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 this. And it, it's really difficult sometimes just to, just to think, yeah, but hang on, you know, we've, we've got kids who are really kind, and we, you know, we've got kids who are resilient, and, we, and we've got children who, who know how to get over things. And it, it's almost like holding on, not letting the good stuff, stuff sift through the sieve. And even as like a head teacher, it's really, really hard just to have that that message for me and then translate it to, to, to staff and the children. You know, it's okay to be anxious because there's some amazing stuff going on as well. And it, we link you know, we have celebration assemblies on a Friday, which, 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 we, which we push and push and push and really celebrate the big things going on. So it is, you know, it's, from a school point of view, it's kind of top down for me, kind of flipping it around. Yeah, we, you know, we have got a lot of needs. You know, I, I can't get away from that. I can't take, you know, we're trying to help. But it's equally thinking that we have got some amazing kids and we do amazing things every, every day. Just flipping it around and you know, holding on. <laughs> sometimes we need it, good God. <laughs> sometimes we really need it. There's good stuff going on. Let's not forget about it. Any more questions? Is there, and what time will up? Well, then, if there is nothing else, then I think you'll all join me in thanking our amazing panel.